All right, we are live. Uh, I'm Pastor Mike Winger. A lot of you guys know me. I try to help people learn to think biblically about everything, but I've brought on a guest today, a special guest. I guess you're you're that way. Uh, Vocab Malone, also known as a street apologist, and I have a link to his YouTube channel down below if you guys want to check it out. I've known Vocab for a while now. We met a few years ago, um, but today we're talking about something that you've spent a great deal of time working on, which is Black Hebrew Israelites. And this is a particular group that I don't know as much about, but I've been asked about a lot and thought it'd be good to bring someone on who knows what's up to walk us through who are they, what they believe, how to interact with them, how to actually reach them and change minds, and to talk about why it, why it matters. This particular group is concerning for a few different reasons. So, uh, Vocab, why don't you just tell us a little bit about yourself and then introduce us to the Black Hebrew Israelites. Like, who are they? Sure. When I was uh, in high school, I started researching my own faith to make sure it was real. And I got engrossed in apologetics to answer my own questions. And as I did that, I wanted to tell other people. I started telling other people they had questions. So then I had to go to research their questions. Next thing I know, evangelism and apologetics were connected. And I found myself, for lack of a better phrase, out on the street talking to people. And through that, interacted with all kinds of beliefs and ideas, including the Hebrew Israelites. And so that's when I started really uh, studying them more because it, at the time there wasn't a lot of resources. These days there is a little bit more. And I just kind of went in and I just really never stopped because the further I went, it seems like the ideology kept on growing and growing and growing. And so it was kind of a situation where we needed all hands on deck. And so uh, there's a number of us and we we deal with the ideas presented in the ever-changing theology, sometimes online and sometimes even out on the corner on the street, you know, face to face as well. Yeah, in fact, you were just down in my area a few like last week, was it last weekend? Yeah, uh, a week ago, basically, we were in yeah. San Diego, and uh, ultimately we were there because there's some uh, Muslims who do dawah that's inviting people into Islam at a beautiful park there called Balboa Park. But we knew that wasn't until Sunday. And so we said, well, let's also go talk to some Hebrew Israelites. So we ended up talking to Sakari. Uh, one of the main people who got to have a conversation was Adam Coleman. And it was a decent conversation, you know, I decent like back and forth. Yeah, Adam did great. He's a great guy. It was sad, though, because they did like a follow-up video. And in that, they were just really unfair to him. And it was it was tough because they, they ruined a somewhat – helpful dialogue with with some of the stuff they said in the commentary you know sometimes this kind of thing yeah. happens yeah. but nonetheless um everyone involved learned a lot you know john mccray from you know what do you mean he was there sam shamoon david wood a number of other brothers and sisters a younger guy named carlton and of course uh, adam myself so it, it was an awesome time so all right break us in a little bit uh you know big picture if you've never heard of the hebrew israelites or the black hebrew israelites like what do we need to know 101 who is this group uh, the key thing is the ideology of Hebrew Israelism, and the essence of it is if you're negatively impacted by the transatlantic slave trade, you might just be a true Israelite. There's different ways you can phrase that, but that's the essence of Hebrew Israelism. Now, there's a lot of things that are generally associated along with it because that claim in and of itself, although historically dubious, is not heretical per se. Um it's all the things that get attached and the way this newly discovered, if it really is discovered, identity becomes the, the pinnacle of a person's identity and the trump card in their theology. So everything gets thrown out of whack. Everything's all tapsy-turvy. It's almost impossible. Um, I'm speaking anecdotally. Maybe it is possible. But, Mike, it is almost impossible to find a Hebrew Israelite of any type or stripe who is balanced in their view of Christ and in their supposed view of them being an Israelite. So there's like this issue that probably most people aren't even thinking of that becomes the center of the, the unifying truth yes. in the movement. And then it just – from there it branches out and it has really detrimental impacts on sort of central Christian beliefs, or at least it seems that it does that regularly. So yes, like, I'll give you – oh, go ahead. You know, go ahead. I'll give me an give example. example. Yeah. Yeah, I was going to give you examples. I want to I want to be a good boy here, right? Be a good apologetics boy. Give an example of, of what you're saying. Uh, the Trinity is one of the first doctrines to go. And I'll tell you how it works. There's a few ways that the devil uses Hebrewism to attack the Trinity. One is people start reading stuff and, and say, oh, my goodness, this is a Greco-Roman idea inspired by pagan philosophy. Who knows what sources they're getting a hold of? Generally speaking, they're not very good sources. You've seen this stuff online. 
And since now they understand themselves as an Israelite, there's an over, there's a new kind of oversensitivity towards anything that they're concerned is non-Israelite. So the Trinity now is deemed as this other thing that was an intrusion into true uh, Messiah follow, you know, d- being a disciple of the Messiah, or also because of this new emphasis on the Old Testament, almost as if the new hasn't even come. Because of that, uh, the, the Trinity gets diluted because I think most of us, even if we believe the blueprint for the Trinity is in the Old Testament, understand the doctrine is more explicitly laid out with the incarnation and the subsequent growth of the early church. As we see that, we understand we want the complete package to have a better Trinitarian understanding of God's nature. This new emphasis on the Old Testament, really sometimes at the exclusion of the new, as if it's kind of like this, this addendum and sometimes even wrong. Sakari, the group we were out talking to Saturday, Mike, straight up says, as one of their points of doctrine, Paul went off, and Paul made errors. And if we defend him, they'll say, oh, here you guys are uh, defending the doctrine of man over and against the doctrine of God. That's part of what they'll say, which is ironic, right? And so that's an example of something that goes often. I've only met a few Trinitarian Hebrews delights in my life, and I, I don't think there's any camp or group that's officially Trinitarian except for one church I know of. And they're off balance in so many other ways that their Trinitarian doctrinal statement doesn't save them from imbalance in other ways. Yeah. Wow. So, okay. Um, I think one of the questions that we're probably going to have in the audience right now is, wait, so are these, are these Jews? Are these people Jewish? They're, they're, they're saying they're, they're from Abraham's stock. Is that like a, it, it sounds like it's not coming from a genetic ancestry going back to Abraham or even a, f- a faith ancestry that traces back through the faith of the generations, but rather a experiential thing. Like if you went through this experience of the the transatlantic slave trade, then you are therefore this people group. Is, is that right? Yeah, sometimes I say that the Hebrew Israelite interpretation uses, rather misuses, Deuteronomy 28 as a genetic test kit, meaning... Most Hebrews lights, not all, a lot are unsure about DNA. That's not really a place they look. Now, some do get into it. Don't get me wrong. But a lot are very skeptical of it, right? And they'll say, you know, that's not what the Most High intended us to, to do is to look to, to this. What he intended is for us to look at the signs that would follow his people when they disobeyed him. And then they'll list these curses that are in the latter half of Deuteronomy 28. And they'll say, what's the only people group you know who has experienced all those? And they'll say something like the so-called Africans, because they don't believe that they're actually African. They believe they're Israelites who passed through Africa. So they do believe they're genetically Israelites. Mm -hmm. They just usually don't use genetic science to get there. Some of them will use it as a support. But generally speaking, it's Deuteronomy 28 and other passages that they – tie together to say we fulfill those so they would use scripture sort of as a way to point to themselves yeah now let's let, later on we'll go we'll go into deuteronomy 28 and we'll look at you know we'll talk about sort of like how you walk through these issues uh but i just want to get like a big scope understanding of the group as a whole so they're they're saying uh we've gone through experiences that we find described in deuteronomy 28 that show yes. that we're the people that experienced the, these curses which means we also have those promises which means we're yes we're israelites we're the true israelites and yes. do they connect that to like a specific tribe or just like the tribes scattered abroad, like the diaspora or something like that? So if they're part of what's called a one West camp. So think of one West as not a specific group, Mike, but think of if I use the term one West, think of it as if I describe the Wesleyan holiness tradition, right? There's not a denomination per se called Wesleyan holiness, but you understand it's an umbrella term to describe various branches of Christianity in the sense of denominational structures. One West or one Westism is a certain type of Hebrew Israelism. Mm-hmm. If they're a one Wester, a telltale sign of a one Wester is, to answer your question, the 12 tribes chart. The 12 tribes chart is usually on a sandwich board if they're out on the street situation. And what it does is it has on the left a modern day – I'm sorry, one of the ancient 12 tribes of Israel. And on the right, um, a corresponding modern day people group or ethnic uh, or even geographical boundary. For example, we'll say Reuben, Seminole Indians, Simeon, Dominicans, Manasseh, Cubans, Ephraim, Puerto Ricans. You get the idea? And Uh then they would turn to Genesis 49 – 
where there's cryptic kind of future prophecy given based upon each son's character at the time. And they'll say, here's how you know. Issachar had burdens that he carried. Well, the Mexicans had the burden of the Spanish and the English as oppressors. And it says that Issachar entered into a land of rest. And we see that uh, Mexico is a beautiful place where they take a siesta. Therefore, Mexicans are Issachar. So the one Westers do go to specific tribes. So they're not yeah. even really black Hebrew. They're not even really black Hebrew Israelites. They're Hebrew Israelites who have all kinds of different people, Native American, Hispanic, thrown into their 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 group of the Israel. Mm -hmm. Other ones, non one Westers, Mike, they don't believe in the twelve tribes chart. They think it's hokum. They think it's malarkey, and they think yeah. it's a travesty to add Mexicans and Native Americans, for example, into the group of Israel, they, they would think it's mainly only black folks, and they would think that most of them are probably from the tribe of Judah or the southern tribes. Right. That's, that's the general consensus. And they, or they'll say, we don't really know who's who. We just know you're an Israelite if you went through this. And th those guys you usually don't see on the street. They, an example of that group would be Israel of God, which Mike has a 6,000-seat church in South Chicago. So we're talking about a big group as wow. you've got, but you won't, you won't really see them on the street. Yeah. You, you know, but technically I think the place is called Riverdale, but it's, it's a suburb of South Chicago. So, on that note, real quick, just, okay. Overall, there's lots of, and this is what I've learned from watching your content here. And you talk about this, there's tons of different groups and they're not sometimes not friendly at all with each other. There's some infighting that goes on. Uh, so, you know, Hebrew Israelites is like a big umbrella that represents a lot of things and you're, aware of the nuances mm -hmm. there but as far as the umbrella goes uh, how many people are we talking about and how quickly is it growing uh, as, as far as currently that's what's fascinating i'm actually going to read something here mm -hmm. briefly from a, a little article that was recently done and th this is fascinating um library research recently mike uh they did a research on black americans views on israel and listen to an excerpt that summarizes the findings okay Many African Americans said they think more positively about the nation of Israel because of the historic connections between their journey of their because between the journey of their ethnicity and the journey of the Jews. So just pause real quick. That's sort of historic. If you listen to a lot of the old spirituals, for example, oh, yeah. uh, there's connections because they saw a parallel in the suffering, right? Or yeah. Harriet Harriet Tubman was called Moses, for example, right? So that. That parallel was understood by many. Nat Turner, I'm not saying that, uh, you know, killing babies like Nat Turner ended up doing was good, but he did understand a parallel between Israelites and black Americans' plight, right? And I wouldn't disagree with that part. Now, the Hebrew Israelites try to claim that he actually thought they were Israelites. That's not true. But that's historic, but it's morphed into something more. Continue on real quick. Check this out. Around a quarter said their opinion of Israel has been positively influenced due to the historic parallels between the enslavement of Jews in ancient Egypt and blacks in America, 27%. And due to the similarity between the two groups overcoming oppression, Jewish people in pursuing the promised land and African Americans pursuing civil rights, 26%. Interestingly, most respondents to the survey, 62%, said they were not familiar with the teachings of black Hebrew Israelites. So they actually asked them this in this Lifeway research, which is a big deal. So 62% yeah. didn't even hear about it. A group mm -hmm. that contends that black Americans are physical descendants of the ancient Israelites. Very few, 4% considered themselves to be a black Hebrew Israelite. Now, 4% may not sound like much. So people are like, oh, we don't got to worry about these guys. Ladies and gentlemen, 4% of black America is a million and a half people. If you do the numbers, depending on how you count it, because there's these issues of how do you count so-called biracial people, and there's these, these questions about who counts. But it's about a million and a half people who self-identify in some way as a Hebrew Israelite. Now, does that mean there's a million and a half people ready to go stand out on your local metropolitan street corner on a Saturday and yell at you for four hours? No. But that certainly is part of an aspect, probably the most visible part of Hebrew Israelism if you live in a city. Yeah, I and have so seen 4 them here is actually in, uh... a big deal. Yeah, I have seen them out here in Long Beach, not recently since COVID pretty mm -hmm. much, but before that up on Downey Avenue. <laughs> and uh, and you can, you know, I, I look and I'm like, that those are Jehovah's Witnesses, those are Mormons, those are Hebrew Israelites. Like you could just tell. Um, yeah, yeah, now, yeah, yeah. take me back like 30 years from 30 years ago, 1991, like how many were there then in the U.S.? Because it seems like I'd never heard of this before. Right. Well, uh you know, if you go back a little bit further into the 1890s, that's the first discernible moment in history that we know of that somebody said black Americans equal Hebrews. 
right. uh, William Crowdy, and shortly after him, someone named F.S. Cherry. And they established churches and da-da-da, and you don't really hear much about it until 19 uh, – until the early 1900s, then this thing pops up called the Commandment Keepers. But you can tell by the name, it's sort of a – kind of like a black rabbinic Judaism in a way. It's a lot more Old Testament based. But out of the Commandment Keepers group, which was pretty big in Harlem, and a lot of – there's a lot of scholastic uh, research on, on the Commandment Keepers because scholars have found them interesting. Although their group has almost dwindled out, their legacy and influence is still felt to this day. In 1969 – a small group of men left the commandment keepers in Harlem and eventually established a school at 1 West 125th Street. And that's why we call them One Westers, who, those who come out of that school of thought. And I've actually visited the location. The bottom of it is a uh, 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 not a steak and shake, but that other one, something shake. I forget what it's called, but Shake Shack, something like that. Okay. Anyways, and so uh, been there. And uh, that school had a lot of splits. And from those splits in the mid 90s, became all these little groups. And once they uh, learned how to use YouTube to promote their doctrine, it was on. So they were early – some of them were early adopters to YouTube, kind of YouTube point, point, you know, 1.0 kind of stuff, right? And the earliest camps that did it blew up because of, because of the YouTube stuff. And then sort of in the modern era, like the, the last 10 years where there's been kind of heightened tension and these, a lot of these things uh, really resurfaced in a, a more ferocious way in our cities. Oh, yeah. Hebrew Islamism seems to have benefited positively from that and exploded the past 10 years especially. And almost every camp that I know of has experienced growth. That's a Hebrew Israelite group. And there's been more and more splinters, and the splinters grow. Even in my own city, I've seen them go from one corner to like 10 corners just in the past five years. And so we are talking about exponential growth. And um, that's why, you know, people, they don't want to take it serious. But imagine if you were there in the beginning of Mormonism. You might have thought it sounded silly, but next thing yeah. you know, they're all over Ohio, they're all over Missouri, they're all over Utah. So you better watch out. Yeah, you don't even have to sell me on this. I'm so on the same page. <laughs> yeah, it's yeah. like catch these things when they're beginning to trend or even earlier if you can help it and, and get it now. Get the content out there that's dealing with it so that people can be equipped to respond to it. Because in the end, this is not a us versus Hebrew Israelites thing. This is about right. the truth of Christ. It's about being mm -hmm. faithful to the word of God. It's about uh, really just holding fast to the truth. That That's it. And wanting other people to have that truth as well. Uh, now... That so so they're growing significantly, and I just I mean just imagine that all of the racial tension that's going on helps because at the core of this is a lot of that, and so um, that probably assists as well. Now, are the Hebrew Israelites pretty much the people who are part of the movement? Are they pretty much all like black people? Or is there a, a variety that's within there? Or is like if if a white person came and said I'd like to join the group, what what does that look like? All right, so. Uh, let's say you're Mike Winger and you say, I'm Mike Winger, uh, I'm of European descent, right? Yeah. You Irish. could go to, you could, you, you say you said that, right? You could go to GOCC, Gathering of Christ Church. GOCC teaches you, you are a Gentile, you're not an Israelite like us, but you can be grafted in. And a lot of the other groups criticize GOCC for allowing Gentiles at their Passover. And so that's one group, and they're even a One West group. Or you could go to Israel of God that I mentioned earlier. You could go, and they would say, okay, just, just let us teach you, brother. So one thing that's big with these groups, like Israel of God, for example, is they believe in something they kind of officially, almost with a capital P, call the protocol. And by that they mean you can't go out of order, kind of like we would hold a well, I don't know about you, but Chris, certain Christians hold a complementarianism. They think there's an established order of creation. GOCC or especially IOG, that's Israel of God, is big on there's a protocol. There's an order in God's creation. So a Gentile is how they would see you. Uh, that's how they see me as well. Can can only teach other Gentiles, can have no teaching authority over someone who's deemed an Israelite. Doesn't matter the okay. age, doesn't matter the level of knowledge, anything like that. Now, let's say you said, well, I still want to teach, man. Well, then you've got to go all the way out to Tennessee. And you can join up with Straightway Ministries, uh, and uh, you can Straightway Truth Ministries under Pastor Dow, and he'll he'll say, um, "Hey, you can join in, and and we'll even let you teach." And the wild thing about his group is they have a massive internet influence. And for whatever reason, I think it's because they promote sort of a hyper masculinity. Not that I'm against not, not that I'm against masculinity, but sort of a toxic masculinity in the sense of 
toxic gets overused, but the way they promote it almost could be. Well, that does seem like an example of toxic masculinity. You know, it's got to have some meaning. Anyways, I don't right. want people to think I'm a snowflake over here. But, <laughs> but anyways, snowflake. you could go over there. They've got a lot of NFL players, former NFL players in their group. Uh, and uh, when I say a lot, I mean a lot. And almost all their NFL players who have joined up with Straightway are former professing Christians when they were in the when they were in the league. Mm. So you could join with them. Or you could go to GMS, Mike. So I'm telling you all the cults you can join. You could go to GMS and say, here I am. They'll say, well, who's your father? And my father is a McCluskey, and he's Irish. Okay, well, we know that there was black Irish. Do you resonate with our teaching? They're not going to say it that way. They'll say, do you believe what we're saying? Do you vibe with it? And you say, yeah. And then they say, well, let me hear your breakdown of such and such. And you, you say, hey, my spirit says, because the, the spirit cries out, uh, and, the, and the spirit of the prophets discerns, they use First Corinthians and they use Galatians, which says our spirit cries out a father. And they'll say, we discern that you are an Israelite, even though you don't look like a stereotypical Israelite. And and so you would actually be deemed a genetic Israelite. And if another camp say, hey, this guy's white, how come he's in your camp? And they'll say, well, haven't you read the passage in, in, in Daniel? And uh, I think it's in Hosea. One says that Israel will be as a speckled bird. And the other one says that there will be confusion of face. So they use those two passages to say Israel will become mixed looking, even though you actually are really an Israelite. So they're not looking at you, Mike, as we're accepting a white guy. They're saying you're a European uh, or you appear to be a European because of the mixture but you actually are an Israelite on your father's side. It's just you you look the way you look. They're mm -hmm. not saying you're a white guy we're letting in. We're saying you look like a white guy, but you're actually Israelite. That's GMS. Yeah. So some of the groups will let a white person in, but it's under different ways. Now, sure. let's say it's ISUPK. Last, last example I'll get. They say if you're white in any way, you, you look at how you look, you can't even come to our barbecue. You are not allowed to eat with us in a public park when we have our barbecue. It literally says in their flyer, no whites. So, so <laughs> they, they must not like Paul, right? Like they, they have to reject what Paul says. They turn to Paul. Uh, I'm sorry. They turn to Peter and they say, look, Peter says that the, the wicked and the corrupt twist P uh, Paul's letters. And that's exactly what you white Christians do. You twist his. So we need to get an understanding on Paul based upon the Israelite understanding, because didn't he say he's a Hebrew of Hebrew, not your white European d d twisting of Paul. They would say you don't understand Paul. ISUPK, for example. Yeah. Other ones like Ron Shields, Divine Prospect, Kingdom Harbinger Ministries and uh, Sakari, they would say Paul was simply wrong sometimes or that he's offering a rabbinical opinion for Gentiles that has no bearing on me. Yeah. So they, they have different ways yeah. to deal now with the, Paul. So the interesting thing here is that none of this is actually totally new. Um, so yeah, right. you know, the connect, there's a connection here between these guys, a strong connection, and those who are like Torah observant and who mm -hmm. feel like we're, we're Gentiles are supposed to be brought under the law. And, and they wouldn't identify themselves as genetically Israel, but they would say, I'm still coming under the law. Um, that, that that's what Jesus wants. And then that group, right, that the Torah observant would, would fall into two mm -hmm. broad camps of those who say you misunderstood Paul and those who say, no, Paul's wrong. Like these are the same, these are the same camps because they have to deal with the same issues. So that's kind of interesting. Right. Um, now, let, let's Mike, talk a little bit. There's even a, no, there's ahead, even a little bit of Mormonism. There's, there's, there's even a little bit of Mormonism in there. You know, Mormons, how they teach that the Native Americans are descended from ancient Israelites. That's true. Or at least some of them. Yeah. Hebrew yep. Israelites of the one West variety teach the same thing. But go ahead. I'll, I'll, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to interrupt you. I just thought you yeah. one more. Uh, connection I wonder how I much of the population there. of the world they would they would say is actually descended from Abraham, because it sounds like it's becoming a pretty large amount of the planet. That's what I say sometimes to some of them. And uh They'll sometimes say, well, uh, you know, white people have a genetic defect. You guys are the minority. They start sounding like Nation of Islam members sometimes at that yeah. point. Or they'll say, uh, hey, well, uh, sand of the sea, stars of the sky. Uh -huh. You know? I'm so still curious right. what percentage they put on it. But <laughs> right. <laughs> but at any rate. Sometimes um, I ask, I, I'll ask what percentage of the curses do you have to experience to be an Israelite? Because some of them say there's still some West Africans less than, left in Israel. And I'll say – or I'm sorry, le there's still some Israelites left in West Africa. I'll say, yeah, but they didn't experience a transatlantic slave trade. And they'll say, well, you don't have to experience all the curses. I was like, well, then how is Deuteronomy 20, 6, 8 a defining aspect of what it means to be Israelite if you don't experience it to be an Israelite? Okay. Yeah. Anyways. All right. There's – okay. There's so much more still to cover. Okay. So what are their attitudes, generally speaking, towards uh, what most of us would consider actually Jewish people – say, the nation of Israel, that kind of thing? What, what's their attitude? I'm just going to say it, and they're going to be mad at me, and I just, I love them, but they, they need the truth. 
I've never met a Hebrew Israelite who's not an anti-Semite. Never. Now, they'll say, how can we be anti-Semitic? We are Semitic. Yeah. Right? But that's not even a good argument, and it's assuming the, the issue anyway. Yeah. Even the nicest Hebrew Israelite seems to have a strong distaste towards anything they think is Jewish. And um, they call them Khazars. So they believe in the Khazarian theory, which is basically they're frauds. They use Revelation 2.9 and 3.9 against them to say they're the synagogue of Satan. They believe, some of them, that they're descendants of Amalek, so sort of one of the worst tribes out of the Edomites, the Amalekites, because they're historic enemies to Israel. So they actually think they're like a head tribe of Edom, and Edom's also a historic enemy of Israel. So they'll put other uh, things upon them. Mm -hmm. uh, almost all of them have accused me of being a crypto Jew at some point. They'll mm -hmm. look up my real last name and say some Jews share this last name. But here's the thing. They seem to be under this uh, assumption, it's false, that almost all people who self-identify as Jews are white. But that's only Ashkenazi. And it's true Ashkenazi are more prominent in world affairs, and it's it's uh, a true sort of a lot more people know about them. But that's not the only kind, for lack of a better word, of modern-day Jew there is. There's Sephardic. There's Jews who never left Iraq. Now, most of them have left now, but when I say left, I mean prior to uh, what, what has happened in Iraq now. But the Iraqi Jews, uh, Jews in Persia, uh, Jews in Africa, uh, all over, and they look all kinds of different ways. Yeah. And um, generally, they just discount most of them as being ethnic and religious frauds, and they tend to have a strong distaste for them. There are some of them, Mike, who dislike Israel so much, they teach, and I'm not joking about this, that real Israel is in West Africa, that the Jews have actually swapped out the world's understanding of where the promised land is, and it's not even in the Middle East. It's actually in West Africa. Yeah, One group that teaches that is called Teo Ministries. It's a real thing. Yeah. They really teach this, and you're like, bro, you're talking about like trading like musical chairs with the map, you know? Yeah. yeah, it's deeply conspiratorial at that point, and that's that's when yeah. you realize this is not so much about data as it is about trust. Like you simply don't trust right. anyone except your leaders, and so whatever they say must be true. And any research into data is conspiracy. Okay, well, that, yeah, the maps say that because of all these fake people. Oh, hold it up, hold it up Can to you? yeah, that, that's the one. The Jewish, back it up a Can bit. You? <laughs> it's a little too close. There you go. The Jewish masquerade, the relationship between modern Jews and ancient Hebrew Israelites. So this is like a and Hebrew look Israelite. At the, so yeah, that, the whole book is about how, how uh, Jews are basically fakes. Uh, yeah. And this is, of course, one of the problems with this with this movement, right? Because they're, you know, they're being taught something. Told There are truths here. There are truths here. And, the, and there are some parallels. And, and I think helpful parallels that have helped people who've gone through suffering and slavery and stuff like that when they look and they see how God delivered the people of Israel through all that stuff. But um, but it turns into like um, something else when they decide they're going to say, no, that's us, we're you. And let's talk about how how you have to change Christianity and, and Judaism, in a sense, Jewish history, in order to make this work. So what do, what do they believe about Jesus? I wish there was a simple answer to that. A lot of these guys uh, would say they believe Jesus is a Messiah and that they hold to the authority of the New Testament. But there is a significant portion of Hebrew Israelites who adopt in an Old Testament or Tanakh only or non-Messianic, although they don't like that term, uh, view and where um, they don't think Jesus was the Messiah. And at that point, you could almost use a lot of the resources you would get from like a Michael Brown, for example, to have some of these discussions with some of those guys. One prominent guy who uh, I respect a lot, you know, he, he's, uh, he's, he's a respectful, uh, really interesting guy. His name is Zion Lex. He's a prominent Old Testament only Hebrew Israelite. Um, the other ones, I got to tell you, Mike, unless, unless they're trying to prove Jesus looked like them, you don't hear a lot about Jesus. The main time you hear about Jesus is when they go to Revelation chapter 1 and try to show from the description of his majesty and glory that it's actually a description of his ethnicity. So they don't even talk about how this is really a description of Jesus' deity. Yeah. Because most of them don't believe Jesus is God, by the way. Let's briefly talk and, about that because yeah. I've seen this one a lot. So what's the Revelation passage? Revelation chapter 1, I believe it's verses 14 and 15. I'll yeah. put it up on screen for everybody here. So we can discuss this. Um, you know, I don't really care 
well, you know, I don't have an axe to grind on what Jesus looked like. I'd like to know what he really looked like. That's and we all like that. But uh, but there's yeah, this is they'll a good example it, they'll of say, a proof text. They'll, yeah, yes, it is. They'll say if it doesn't matter, then why why do all your churches have pictures of white Jesus in them? My church doesn't have a picture of a white Jesus in it. So that, I'm just saying that's the kind of thing they would say in response. Yeah. Oh, now it doesn't matter. Now it doesn't matter. Now that we're coming into knowledge of who we are, all of a sudden yeah. the white Christians tell us it doesn't matter. But for yeah. generations, we've opened up our Bible and seen a guy that looks like you. It seemed to matter then. You yeah. see what I'm saying? I get that, except that I've, as long as I've been a Christian, I never thought Jesus was white ever. And, and and I have very little respect good. for Renaissance artists and their theology. <laughs> so, right. so so personally, it's just like, yeah, you're just making stuff up about me. I don't know what you're doing. But um, you know, Jesus was was Jewish. You know, he's Middle Eastern. But okay, Revelation one fourteen says the hairs and, and explain to us how they use it and how you'd respond to it if you would. The hairs of his head were white, like uh, like white wool, like snow. His eyes were like a flame of fire. His feet were like burnished bronze, refined in a furnace. And his voice was like the roar of many waters. All right. Now, uh... and then I guess see, at, the, at the end of verse 16, it says his face was like the sun shining in full strength. So, yeah. So, the, so I, I like the ESV. They... So a lot of them use the KJV, and just by way of comparison, if I I'll, I'll look at it so you guys can see how, what that says as well. Sure, I can, um, just I can so bring you can see. Up. Give me just a sec here. Make it bigger. Yeah, there's, there it is. His head and hair were white like wool, as white as snow. His eyes like a flame of fire. His feet were like fine brass. Oh, it looks like I lost. Lost him. Just a second, y'all. Are you head over like Moses off the mountain? Oh, there you go. Huh? Are we back? I lost you for a second. Oh, I'm sorry about that. That was weird. Uh, so they'll gloss over his head was white. His head was white. Yeah. You see what I'm saying? Because it says right, it's that there. It's not just his hair, but his head too. <laughs> yes. Yeah. And they'll say, well, that just means it was shining or something. But then the hairs, if you look at all their portrayals, they have a Jesus who's got a hair full of white hair, uh, a head full of white hair. Right. And uh, he looks like he's like 65 years old, right? And so sometimes we'll joke around with him and say, man, that is the oldest looking 33 year old I've ever seen. <laughs> mm -hmm. Not that Jesus has to stay looking 33 for eternity, but it's just funny. They're like, here's what Jesus looked like. And like, you know, last we knew of him. But here's what they zoom in on. White like wool. They'll say, who's the only people who have wooly hair on this planet? They'll say the so-called black man. But of course, notice what it says right, right after it, as white as snow. So obviously it's talking about texture because it's like your mom is so fat. How fat is she? Right? Well, his hair was so white. How white was it? You see what mm -hmm. I'm saying? Yeah. White like wool, as white as snow. And I'll say it's talking about tech. Uh, it's not talking about texture. It's talking about color. They'll say, no, it's talking about both. And I'll say, OK, what's the texture of snow? If it's talking about both with the wool, then wouldn't it be talking about both with the snow? What? Who has texture? Who Whose hair texture is like snow? You see what I'm saying? So the, usually, though, they just do these in rapid fashion, yelling it out. And whenever they get to a point, everyone, you know, hoorahs. And so it's very difficult to really get into this discussion. They just go over it because right. this is not a description of Jesus on a Saturday night. You see yeah. what I'm saying? Oh, yeah. That's at, the key. As, That's the key. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. As white as snow and his eyes were as flame of fire. And I kid you not, uh, a lot of the groups say that's because – I, I wish I didn't have to repeat this, Mike. A lot of the groups say black folks' eyes get red when they drink, and Jesus, the Bible says he's going to come back uh, drinking of, of wine, uh, basically mad as heck, right? They'll say other language. But they actually say uh, the fiery flaming eyes are because his eyes are red from drinking. And again, I'm, it's so, not, it's but, not a okay, joke. Okay, listen, it's, here's a reveal it's, moment. It's, yeah, here's a reveal yeah. moment for us. We don't care about the truth of Jesus. We have an agenda. We want to say right. that Jesus looks a certain way to support our theology. So red eyes, alcohol, right? Like I'm going to go right. that way. And th this is, this is a good reveal moment where you just, and, and when they're hitting you rapid fire, a lot of people are like, I don't, I can't respond that quick, but yeah, the text is clearly not describing Jesus as t so you can get his ethnic ethnicity from the description. This is, this is a glorified revelation. It's all deeply symbolic. I don't think it has to tell you anything about Jesus' skin tone or even the color of his hair, for that matter. Uh, at least that's my view on that. What do you think? Well, exactly. I mean, look at verse 13, Mike. And in the midst of the seven candlesticks, one like unto the Son of Man. So he's standing in the midst of seven candlesticks. That's the church. 
Yep. That's about the church. So this Jesus is not really walking around with seven candlesticks around him. Do you see what I'm saying? So right. if they're going to make this literal that Jesus is walking around like with his protective shield like in a video game when you get a star. He's got seven candlesticks roaming around his feet or something. Clothed with a garment down to the foot and girt about uh, the paths with a golden girdle. This is royal – uh, kind of priestly vestments he has on, showing the, the, all his different offices. And for each one of these, you can look and see the Old Testament connections. Yeah. Same thing with this other description. It, it goes back to Daniel chapter 7. That's really where Revelation 114 comes out of. It goes back to Daniel 7. That's that son of man. And the flame of fire, this is the description of Yahweh. He, he's seeking, and he, seech, he seeks about to, to, to judge because this is kind of the mode, and he has this discerning, and, and the, the flame purifies, right? And and check this out. Also, when you look there at Revelation 1.14, you see after at verse 15, his feet were like burnished bronze, refined in a furnace, and his voice was like the roar of many waters. Now, I'm going to go back mm -hmm. to the part uh, uh, about the bronze, but first let me say about the voice of many waters. Yeah. They actually say that is the baritone voice of the black man. So the the the, the yeah. voice of many waters is the is the deep voice like the Barry yeah. White type of voice right right, right. Uh, James Earl Jones right yeah uh, now if you look at it Mike Yahweh when he speaks multiple times in the Old Testament it says and I heard a voice like many waters sounding it's like this right. rushing water pitcher it's yeah. the voice of Yahweh so by yeah. having Jesus have the voice of many waters here it's showing you that when Jesus speaks Yahweh speaks but they yeah. gloss over that to make it a baritone voice right and and it's and it's look they had people with deep voices back then what <laughs> If if you wanted to tell you had a baritone voice, the voice is of a of a large man or something like that, right? But in right. but back then, okay, there's no speakers, there's no amplification, there's no stereo systems. When you want something really loud, you describe the sound of a waterfall or of the ocean during a storm, right? Have you ever been out there? Yeah, it's so loud. The water where a waterfall is so loud, you try to film and your camera can't even film anything except white noise because it's so loud. And um, yeah, so the voice of many waters is to say this like super loud like surrounding voice yeah it's about it's about volume not pitch that's that's, that's good the thing yeah. anyway that that's something a guy with a guitar hanging up in the background would say <laughs> <laughs> and i check this out last one i'll i'll, I'll do uh i don't want to be all over here but i hope this is helpful to people mike oh yeah I think so. uh his feet like unto fine brass as if they burned in a furnace they'll say what color is something when you burn it and people will usually say black or dark they'll say right yeah. so if jesus's feet are black what color could the rest of his body be you think he's going to be a white man with black feet that'd be weird right and so yeah. they'll say well look his feet burn a furnace his feet were black obviously the rest of his body is ignoring earlier what said his head was white right yeah his head and now, hair were white yeah yes now check this out what is this saying as if they burned in a furnace it's actually kind of a fascinating thing because when you when you look at it, it doesn't say as if they were burnt. Uh huh. Here, let's see. It, you're, it, you're reading from the uh, ESV. Is I, it? Well, that's a that was a KJV, but I'm going to go back to the ESV. The so ESV the King, says the King it this James way. has as if refined in a furnace. Oh no, uh, I'm sorry. King that's James, New King. No, that's the ESV. Yeah. Okay. Let me show you I what the. I'll James. show you what it has. I'll just the KJV says KJV. as if they burned in a furnace, but it's still fine because this burn, right. this burn, Mike, it's uh, it's a verb, of course. It's in the perfect tense, passive. It's participle, plural, nominative, masculine. And here's here's the point about saying all that. This is an uh, kind of an action being done unto it. And here's the thing, it's not a finished or completed action. It's not done yet, meaning they're currently burning. It doesn't say the, right. in the English reflects it. If you if you if, if they would just look at it right, it doesn't say as if they were burnt. It says as if they burned in a furnace, meaning as if they were burning. Jesus is sort of a man on fire, and it's mm -hmm. actually very evident when you look at the passage as a whole. Seven golden lamp candlesticks. You see that? The Son of Man. And go back to Daniel 7 to see how he's described. This garment, uh, paps, golden girdle, hairs white like wool, white snow, flame of fire, fine brass, burnished. And then you go down even further, verse 16. In his yeah. right hand, seven stars. What ethnicity holds seven stars? That's not an ethnicity. It's, it's a further right. description of Jesus and his majesty. Majesty, and you can get into symbolism of that as well. Out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword. Again, mm -hmm. that's also not an ethnic description. And look at this. And his countenance was as the sun shineth in his strength. Now, 
right. his countenance there. So that's verse 16. Now, again, I'm reading out of the KJV. I go back over to the ESV. It says his face was like the sun shining in full strength. So he has a, a white or a yellow face or an orange face. If we're going to make it that, no. Again, this is a description of Yahweh and the glory of the Lord. You know, when you go to Moses and the mountain, this is the kind of picture we're getting. Jesus is sort of like a human candy corn in color is the way this is being described. Uh, meaning it's the point is this burning man on fire representing the glory of Yahweh himself. And it's really an attestation to his deity, his majesty, his royalty, his power, his glory. They strip all that away and say this means Jesus is black. Yeah, which is in the beginning at the outset, it's okay, A, it's not trying to tell you what Jesus looked like while he was walking the earth. It's a revelation of Jesus in glory. B, right. all these things are symbolic, as you're saying, to represent truths about Christ. Yes. They're not meant to say this is what he always looks like in, a, in, in his you know, human form or something like that. And then, uh, and then C, if you really take it as a literal physical description of what Jesus just always looks like, it doesn't fit any ethnicity. <laughs> it's just right. like this is – he's just – He's glowing. He's got, you know, light coming out of him. Uh, he's got a sword coming out of his mouth. Uh, let's talk about that. I don't know what ethnicity has swords coming out of their mouth. Right. Obviously, this is not meant to be taken that way. But this is this is what every cult does. They take verses that are, uh, you can say them real fast. You grab a few points. You ask people trick questions, and then you move on to a new verse. You know, and then, yeah, that happens. What are some of the other things, though? If Unless you want to share more on this. What are some other things that... Well, that they that like when they first initially kind of get people into the movement, how do they get you in? How do they sort of convince you that this is true? Deuteronomy 28 is the big one, and Stop. if you're willing to go there, we could. But while we're going there, I want to encourage everyone. You know, we're not making up these interpretations about Revelation. Now, everyone has an Old Testament connection, but some of them John even tells you. And at the end of Revelation 1 is verse 20, and he says this, everybody. As for the mystery of the seven stars that you saw on my right hand and the seven golden lampstands, the seven stars are the angels of the seven churches, and the seven lampstands are the seven churches. John is literally telling you there's a symbolic interpretation to the way I'm describing Jesus. It's like, hey, go find out the rest of it from the Old Testament. But he's like, here's some of the here's some of the code, the key right here, ladies and gentlemen. Now, th the problem is when we refute their misuse of this mic, they'll say, oh, so Jesus was white. Jesus was not white. It would be some kind of strange miracle in the Middle East if he was. It'd be it'd be it'd be the weirdest thing. It'd make the yeah. it'd make the yeah. Jerusalem Daily front page, right? Right. <laughs> but but not being white doesn't mean you're black. This bifurcated view of the world like a post Jim Crow era then it really is a biblical way of thinking and the larger world there's so many more different things and we could even get an archaeology and they've discovered Galilean first century male skulls a whole uh, sort of cache of them and they did the measurements and did this and that and they most closely line up with the Jews of Iraq today who have now mainly left Iraq but they match up with the modern people group as far as the, the way they look and uh, there's even done some artists who, who get into this whole thing about reconstruction Instructions now, and then they'll kind of look at some any contemporary images we have of Israelites, which are few and far, far between, granted. But the Fayyum mummy portraits are perhaps one place, although those, those may mainly be Egyptians. But that's interesting because sometimes Egyptians were confused with Israelites. So we can see what first century Egyptians look like as a cue to maybe the way some first century Jews look like. And it kind of goes on a broad array of range. So there's a lot to do. But the second you start engaging in this, they'll just say, this is just white supremacy. This is, they, yeah. they'll, they'll put it off on something. Yeah else but it's like no let's say jesus was black revelation one's not the place to go to find it mm -hmm. but uh deuteronomy 28 are you ready i'm ready let's dig in this is like probably the main passage right this is sort of the core of okay so there's a lot of variety within the hebrew israelite movement um who right. were suggesting they're not actually hebrew they're not actually israelites but the thing that connects them is this one core idea that they're getting from deuteronomy 28 so walk us walk us through this one well, if you actually look for sermons on Deuteronomy 28, the funny thing is you'll find a bunch of prosperity preachers claiming the first uh, little batch of verses for modern-day Christians <laughs> to be rich. <laughs> and ignoring so all the bad stuff. Yes, yeah, so that's, yeah. that's one interesting thing. But when you start at verse 15, <clears throat> the curse section is longer. Yeah. Now, um, it's just like this. Um, Here's a rough parallel. Uh, you know, there's a business, and uh, it says, uh, you know, I'm gonna pick up, I'm gonna pick up your trash, 
uh, every day for the next year. And here's how much you'll pay me if I pick up your trash. And if I don't, here's what will happen. And if you break the contract, here's what can happen to you. Now, a harsher version of that is these treaties that would be done between a higher and a lesser uh, power, you know, the conquering king with the subjugated people. And in these treaties, you would you would see this kind of thing. Well, God is doing that with Israel here. And so this isn't these aren't prophecies in the proper sense. These are simply conditions of what God is saying will happen. If you do this, then I will do this, right? So it's at the end of the law, and it's is it, it's like this. Hey, I've given you the law. Here it is. If you break it, here's what's going to happen to you, right? And here's the crazy thing, Mike. Almost every single one of these in some way or another you can find fulfilled in the pages of the Old and New Testaments themselves. You don't need a leapfrog to the modern era, right, right. To, to go look to colonialist and imperialist and slave traders to find the fulfillment of them. It's right there in the Old Testament. Everything yeah. from siege warfare to kings be taken away to um, uh, cannibalism, frankly, and things like that, right? Now, when you look at it, there's a lot in here they'll read, and we could look through a couple of them. The key, the big one they focus on, though, is verse 68. Would you be able to read that? Yep. Let me just get there real quick. Deuteronomy 28, 68 says, And the Lord will bring you back in ships to Egypt, a journey that I promised that you should never make again. And there you shall offer yourselves for sale to your enemies as male and female slaves, but there will be no buyer. Right. Now, that's the ESV, which they don't like. And I'll show you in the ESV, but then I'll show you a couple of differences in the KJV with it because they think the KJV is better for uh, their interpretation. Yeah. But uh, so the Lord will bring you back in ships to Egypt. So they'll say, okay, who went in slave ships into slavery that you know of? And obviously people say, well, yeah, people of African descent, da, da, da. And you'll say, well, wait a minute. It says to Egypt, right? No, they'll say, well, if you look up Egypt the way God uses it in the Old Testament, it can just simply mean house of bondage. So it's using Egypt as a symbolic way to describe slavery itself or bondage of some sort. So mm -hmm. this doesn't mean you had to literally go back to Egypt, although the ships are literal. So you would take literal ships back into bondage in, in, in various places, a journey that I promised that you should never make again, because I'll ask them, well, it says make again. Now, can you go back to a place you've never been to? So yeah. it's, it seems clear that it's talking about Egypt because it says, I promise you wouldn't make this journey again. They'll right. say, no, it's just saying back into slavery. Something so again, like that, they right? want a big picture. They want to say that the description in Deuteronomy 28 is of the uh, Africans being brought over to the U.S. And because it fits so well, it proves that they are they are actually the people to whom this promise was given. And so you're, you're pointing out specific things. Okay, well, but you didn't go to Egypt. Oh, well, we take that symbolically. Okay, but it says you'd never make it again, which implies you made it once before. And how did they respond to that? Uh, they say that's just where, you know, we, we wouldn't, we would, we, God said he, we wouldn't go back into slavery, basically, but we're going back because we're breaking the law. It's not really about literally Egypt. It's about house of bondage. Right. Uh, and they, they also use Deuteronomy 2846 as justification for this. So here's Ronald Dalton. He wrote a book called From Hebrews to Negroes. And here's what he said. Here's a quote from Ronald Dalton. And they, the curses, shall be upon thee for a sign and a wonder, and upon thy seed forever. That's the quote he quotes there from Deuteronomy 2846. Because of this, they would also lose their heritage to be enslaved and scattered amongst nations that they didn't know neither the land nor the language. From what country has a majority of slaves been taken and scattered to the four corners of the earth? What race of people has been led into, ca ca into captivity to the many different nations of the world? And so they would look at Deuteronomy 2846 as a justification for how they're misusing Deuteronomy 2868. But then the second part of the verse, the second part of the verse, Mike says this, um, sh uh, and there you shall offer yourselves for sale to your enemies as male and female slaves, but there, no, there will be no buyer. They'll say, okay, that's a wrong translation. We need to go to the KJV. And here's what the KJV says. I got it ready and for there, you. Uh, so you see that, do you see the difference? And there you shall be sold unto your uh -huh. enemies. For bond men and bond women, and no man shall buy you. Do you see the difference? Yes. Yeah. So in so, one, you're selling yourself, and the other, you're being sold. Right. Yeah. Now, now fitting with the with the ancient like context of slavery, especially back in the day of scripture, it really was like we're in poverty, we have no homes. Then you'd yes. sell yourself. Like that's what you would do. You you you'd have a contract with somebody, and you'd sell yourself into bondage. But here yes. they're saying it's happening to them. You shall be sold. 
so therefore it's it fits more with the transatlantic slave trade right now this this uh verb form uh the verb here translated sell or offer is makar it's a reflexive verb form what that means is the subject of the verb acts upon or with respect to itself and so that's why the modern um, a lot of modern translations are actually better reflecting the grammar of the passage. So the NASB, for example, says, "And there you will offer yourselves for sale to your enemies as male and female slaves." The CSB says, "There you will sell yourselves to your enemies as male and female slaves." Now a lot of Hebrews like to look at the, upon that essentially as a conspiracy that it's been changed to to sort of dampen the reawakening, yeah. right? Which, okay, this uh, is so KJV's. key to me because, listen, this is the key. <laughs> I want to discuss with you the meaning of the text, but in the back of your head, you've been taught there's a conspiracy. So right. anytime you have conflicting information, you're just like, oh, like white lies. That's all. I, and then I move on. I don't, I don't need to actually research. I just need to know I trust these people. I don't trust those people. Then conflicting information is rejected outright. Yeah. No, I mean, it's, it, it, so it is difficult to witness and engage with uh, a Hebrews light with the barriers up. But I want people to remember, if you've dealt with Mormons and Jehovah's Witnesses and Muslims and atheists, it's difficult talking to them too. And it's difficult talking to Joe Sixpack. It's difficult to talk to unbelievers about the gospel because they don't want to believe it, right? right? And that's why we pray for a miracle upon the heart. So if right. someone's like, ah, it's difficult, they're not going to get saved. Well, first of oh, all, yeah. they do get saved. Okay, I'm just saying to the audience, not to you, Mike, I know your heart, but to the audience, guys, uh, people have come out of this and we can give countless testimonies and they're still coming out. Cultish, uh, it, it's a podcast of apology. It just did a recent two-part episode with Oster Dunlap. He was involved for this eight and a half years, a uh, number of years officially as a GOCC member, and the Lord brought him out uh, through a number of circumstances, and now he's doing great. And in fact, he's the best Christian of all, Mike. He's reformed. So it's amazing to see. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I just had to see that once. He went straight to the good stuff, Mike. So right, just, yeah, <laughs> man. I'm not there yet. I'm maybe one day. <laughs> I'm just teasing everyone. Please don't get mad. I hope you don't I know. Yeah, yeah. Me and Vocab, <laughs> we, don't, we don't care. Um, yeah, we really don't. I just, I, I, I don't even sweat it. I, I, I don't want to lose relationships over Reformed theology. Yeah, but uh, yeah. Besides, I think but I no. am Reformed. I'm just not Calvinist. <laughs> hey, you know what? That's all right, man. You do, you know what? Uh, yeah, that's that's all right, man. No, but Starting so, fires. so, 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 what you see is is uh, they, they'll go there and they'll say, well, you'll be sold into your enemies, and. Now, here's the thing with it, Mike. Let's go with the KJV for a second, which right. is a less accurate rendering of the grammar, right? Because we understand Makar's reflexive there. But let's just go with, there you shall be sold unto your enemies. Yeah. Why would people be selling them if no one will buy them? And also, how is it a curse if no one buys you? Wouldn't that be good if you're being sold into slavery? Hey, no buyer, I'm free. Not only that, this doesn't sound like an accurate description of the slave markets in the Carolinas. They were stealing and jacking and kidnapping Africans left and right to fill up the 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 so-called need of the colonialists and everywhere else, sugar sugar plantations in Jamaica and everywhere else, to to say, hey, look, we, we gotta get more slaves, man. There was definitely buyers, is my point. This is not an accurate description of the transatlantic slave trade. Now let me show you how the rendering that you will offer yourselves for sale is better. That shows how destitute and pathetic and sad uh, they're going to be. Right. They're going to be in this condition. And to make matters worse, people won't even want to buy them. Now, some of this is fulfilled in some texts like Josephus and some other places where it talks about Israelites selling themselves into slavery and the prices were super cheap. It seems like a fulfillment of this. But it is, that is sort of an extra biblical thing. But even from right. the Bible, you can tell Israelites were in Egypt because uh, – during the days of Jeremiah, God speaks to Jeremiah about going into Egypt with the other Israelites. So this shows even during the days of Jeremiah, there were Israelites already going into Egypt. And so you, so that's an indication of maybe that one being fulfilled as well. But right. uh, 68 is a key verse, but it's not the only one. They'll mm -hmm. look at where it says you'll be the, the, you'll be the borrower, not the lender. That uh, people are going to take your women, all kinds of stuff like that, right? And they'll and they'll point to different things, but there's a lot of things they can't point to uh, that are problematic for them. For example, yeah. it says the king that you set over you will also be brought into captivity with you. What verse is that? Uh, well, let me look. I always lose track of the verse. I always have to do Control F and look for King. 
Yeah, uh, yeah. Da, da, da. Because that because that happened, of course, um, during the days with Israel, right? That actually right. happened. But 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 you don't need to go to. But the question is, okay, where did that happen? Six maybe. Is it thirty six? Let me see. 2836. Yes, it is. The Lord bring you and your king, whom you set over you, to a nation that neither you nor your fathers have known. Mm -hmm. So who is the king over all the Israelites in West Africa? That, that question doesn't even make sense. There's right. multiple different types of ethnicities who are kidnapped. People right. from Mali, people from uh, various kingdoms. It, it, towards the end of the transatlantic slave trade, they even started getting more into the interior. It uh, wasn't even just there on, on the coast. And so uh, there is no king to speak of that was set up but that did happen during the very ending of, of the of the days of judah that did right. happen that even the kings themselves were into captivity in fact remember the king who's they killed his office sons and they poked out his own eyes they gouged out his own eyes yeah. i mean this that literally happened what is described here right now some of them will say well here's this random guy who was a african king they'll bring up some name sometime right other, but I'll say, well, he's the king over everybody, right? It still doesn't work. Or sometimes I'll say, well, we don't know who came over, so sort of an agnostic position. Other ones, Mike, who believe in reincarnation, say this means King, king David or someone like that reincarnated who will be coming over with us. Because some of the Hebrews believe in reincarnation, but there is no good answer for that, and that's just yeah. one. Because the siege warfare is also another example. There wasn't siege warfare committed by colonialists and imperialists and, and, and slave traders against these West African kingdoms. And if you say that, when did siege warfare? They'll say, oh, you're being racist. You're acting like the Africans didn't have any kings and buildings and, and, and high walls. And no, no one's saying that. They're just saying siege warfare is not what happened. And you know of an example where it did. And so then they'll say, well, not all the curses have to happen every time. I say, oh, OK, so how many of them do have to happen? You see, it, it keeps on changing to where it's like, how does this really describe the transatlantic slave trade then when you have a lot of stuff that didn't even happen at the time? Mm -hmm. But it's once you start asking those questions, it becomes problematic. Yeah. Yeah. So it, it, it's um, I, I hate to put it this way, uh, but those who were those who are buying into this, they read Deuteronomy 28, they hear these connections and then they become part of the movement and they think I'm, I'm, a, I'm a Hebrew Israelite. Like you're you're being punished for not paying attention to scripture when you fall for this, because when you do examine it thoughtfully, you just just read. You don't need special texts. You don't need like a lexicon for this. Like you just read it carefully. You look at it in context. You see even the prophets saying, look, all the curses have happened to us like past tense. Like later on, the prophets mention these things and say they've already taken place. So they're acknowledging this stuff's already happened. Um, people are suffering for not paying attention to the world uh, to the word of god they're 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 in pain because they're not giving place to scripture that scripture deserves yeah amen amen so, well mike a, a lot of this is really to be frank with you uh emotional and satisfying a deep emotional longing more than anything and that's yeah. the real power of it because it it gives um especially somebody who whose dignity and has been denied and the the fact of the reality of them bearing the image of god has been denied yeah. in so many ways uh when we're talking about say in american context for example historically uh this flips that over mm -hmm. and turns it around and makes it where hey actually we're the people of the book who this book is about Right. And a lot of them come out on the other side saying, not only are we better than the other nations, you other nations can't even be saved anyway. You're going to be in the kingdom only to serve us. Yeah. So let's let's talk about that eschatology a little bit, where this goes with eschatology. So, But first, let me mention this, that, that I think the gospel offers the right solution. So the wrong solution is let's just flip who's being oppressed and who who's not and who's the oppressor. Let's just reverse roles. Whereas the gospel goes out and says, no, no, let's end this. Let's just end the idea of these oppressions and these separations. There is no Jew. There is no Gentile. There's no slave, no free. In Christ, we're all one, right? We're all, we're all part of the same brotherhood. This is where Paul like rips on Peter publicly because he won't eat with the Gentiles. Yet you're talking, there's movement, there's groups here where they won't, uh, they still won't do that, which is why I figure they have to do something with Paul. But, uh, but yeah, the unity there is in, in the gospel of Christ that we're all made in the image of God and that we're all redeemed through Christ and we're grafted in. Okay, so there's there's our unity, but we're all one. We're not still segmented in these different groups. But um but there is an eschatology that I've 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 caught glimpses of with the Hebrew Israelite movement. Can you tell us kind of some of the expectations they have and is it are there any expectations that are fairly unified across the groups? 
almost all of them that I've heard have some type of ethnic stratification in the kingdom. So they usually don't talk about heaven or something like that. They tend to use just the phrase the kingdom. And almost all of them believe in some kind of ethnic stratification. And so there's levels of that. There's ones that have an extreme hierarchy, and there's some that sort of have a softer, kinder, gentler hierarchy. So I'll give you an example of a kinder hierarchy. There's a rather uh, smart Hebrew Israelite who makes really good hip-hop music, actually, and it's pretty positive. Some of it sounds really Christian, to be frank with you. And I, I like him because he's from Buffalo. That's where my family uh, came through when they when they went in New York. So, so But nonetheless, he, he's confused on a lot of his theology. He says, well, that final relationship between the Israelites, he saying he's one of them, and the Gentiles will be kind of like the way the husband has authority over the wife. It'll uh, it'll be a kind of a of a of a gentle, compassionate uh, ruling over, uh, and that's not even really how I view complementarianism in, in the way he's describing it. I don't think that's a good, accurate complementarianism, but that's he said some stuff like that. Mm-hmm. Then on the other side, well, with this, somewhere in the middle is they're going to serve us, but it's going to be a kind service where they're going to willingly do it, and we're not going to be harsh masters. We're going to be righteous. We're not going to be like it was done in the antebellum slavery to us because we're going to be righteous. So it's not going to be a harsh thing. They're going to enjoy it because they're serving us. They're serving God by serving us. So that's sort of a middle way. On the far extreme, Mike, is it's going to be brutal and uh, I, there's one guy named Tahar who says, I'm going to kick the Edomites. That's his term for white people. I'm going to kick the Edomites ASS every day except for the Sabbath. I'm going to take a break from kicking their A and then start kicking their A again on on, uh, on uh, the next day after the Sabbath. <laughs> and uh, sometimes they do these videos, these kinds of guys who believe in a harsh, brutal slavery for all eternity. Yeah, uh, They'll do these videos where they'll get uh, a non-Israelite in their terminology to bow down to them and kiss their boots or lick the bottom of their shoe, right? I've seen that. And in those videos, yeah, they'll sometimes make jokes about it. And they'll say, you're a good, righteous white man. You're a good, righteous Asian. Uh, I, I'm going to pray the most high I get you in the kingdom. And instead of only a, instead of a thousand lashes, I'm only going to give you nine hundred. I'm, I'm not kidding, by the way. This is the kind of thing they'll say, yeah. and uh, they'll say, you, be, you know, vocab. For example, vocab. You better hope you're one of us because if not, we're going to be kicking your a all eternity, and you know, we're going to pass you around. You know, they, this is this is the stuff some of these these more extreme guys really say. So they refer to it as a brutal kind of slavery, and I even go with that, Mike. I'll say, okay. So is your slaver going to be righteous according to the laws of the Bible? Yes, of course it is. I'll say, okay, okay. So you're going to kick these Edomites butts and, and Africans and Chinese and, and Japanese and Indians, East Indians and all these other nations are going to be kicking their butts for all eternity, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. What happens if you uh, break their break their jaw and uh, their tooth comes out? What are you going to do? What do you mean? What am I going to do? Well, in the Old Testament law, it says if you knock out the tooth of your slave, you've got to let him go. Uh, well, I think that's just talking about a fellow Israelite slave. We're not going to be letting any of our slaves go. No, I'm like, oh, so it's not. <laughs> it's yeah. So I say, oh, so it's not according to the Torah. Yeah. Y- even your slavery that you have is not according to the Torah. Right. They, it's, yeah, you just want to think about that. So I go with their presupposition, and then I'll ask him a question based upon that. So if you knock out my tooth in the kingdom, bro, you got to let me go. Yeah. You know. Just to show them that the Torah yeah. is really just a a source of out of context proofs to support their theology. They're not actually trying to be right. consistent. They're trying to make no. the Bible consistent with their beliefs, which is why it starts to yes. be all weird. Um, so per- percentage-wise, if you have an idea of this, are is it like equally split or as far as the sort of the the nice version of, of bondage or slavery versus the middle ground versus the extreme? Is it, what's the, uh, what's the spectrum as far as how many people in the Hebrew Israelite movement are in one of those camps? I think more probably on the uh, kinder, gentler side. The thing is they're, they have a smaller voice uh, because they're not as vocal out on the corners. And so they're not sort of the vanguard in a way. Right. But I think they're probably a majority. But here's the thing, Mike. I'm I'm being very charitable. Now they'll say, oh, no, vocab is on another channel to slander us. Vocab loves to go to all these white apologists and slander us all over. That's vocab's mission in life because he's a paid Jesuit agent and he's probably a crypto Jew. And right. I bet this guy's Jewish too. He's talking to. Just look at him. Look yeah, at I the know. hand signal he just made. Dude, look at the hand signal. <laughs> Freeze frame right there. Circle it. That, that guy's letting you know he's part of it. Right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So yeah. this what really, you, you what know really what matters. About. What really matters is that I'm <laughs> yeah. white. That's what. That's all that really matters here. Yeah. Got so the, 
but here's the thing. Even the ones – I'm being charitable because even the ones who are a little nicer, like Israel of God, I've mentioned them somewhat favorably a number of times throughout this. Yeah. I was in one of their services once because they'll let me attend as a guest, and I went once. And uh, the main guy who I've met in person and is, was very kind to me in person, he's very warm, and I, I really have respect for him. It's just the theology is really off mic. Yeah. He said, now let's go to Isaiah 14. Let's look at Isaiah 14 here, and let's read that. Let's read Isaiah 14. This is about us. Look what this look what this says. It says, Strangers will be joined to them, and they shall cleave to the house of Jacob. Verse 2 says, People shall take them and bring them to their place, and the house of Israel shall possess them in the land of the Lord for servants and handmaids. And they shall take them captives who captives they were, and they shall rule over their oppressors. And then he stops and he says, you know, I'd really like to have some servants and handmaids, wouldn't you? Amen. Amen. And so they, even the kinder, nicer ones, think that part of the recompense of non-Israelite peoples, and it's not just white folks. People focus on white folks, but remember, they've got all kinds of other people who are other nations as well. Like I mentioned, Japanese, Chinese, Arab, all those as well are Gentiles to them. They're going to serve them as well. So their picture is they're going to be basically weighted on hand and foot. For all eternity. And I had one guy, the last thing I'll say, Captain Zazariak, he said this to me after quoting this verse. He said, Vocab, this is this is why I want Africans and, and white people in the kingdom. Because I'm not I'm not picking no grapes myself. And Vocab, you're gonna want to make my coffee and bring it to me. You know why? Because you're gonna want to live and not die. <laughs> and so that's sort of the extreme version. But even the nice version, Israel of God, still has this picture of being weighted on hand and foot. So really, Mike, their vision of the afterlife. It's just this earth during antebellum slavery flipped over upside down, just yep. permanent. And it's yeah. right because this time the right people are on top. The, a lot of them don't even think uh, what was done in slavery is objectively wrong. It's just the wrong group was doing it to the wrong group. Mm -hmm. Do you so see it, what I'm saying? Yeah, it becomes a uh, racial elitism entitled supremacy. It's, it's like black supremacy is what it sounds like. Well, they'll say Israelite supremacy because remember, a lot of yeah. these groups will take uh, Hispanic yeah. and Native American. They'll say, "Oh, blacks a slur. We're, we're blacks a okay. color. What? That's not." A, I'm just, I'm just saying. I, yeah. I refer to it what you just said. I usually, say, I use the term ethnic hierarchy. Yeah. I, I call it ethnic hierarchy, and uh, mm -hmm. they laugh at the term. Oh, he's trying to use those seminary words, but then when I mean, right. they describe it, they basically agree. Yeah, there is an sure. ethnic hierarchy. So, so there's what? more nuance well, than just saying black supremacy. There's definitely more nuance than that. Although it might look like that in many cases, but um, but in the end, this is antithetical to the gospel. This is the opposite of, yes, of what Scripture is. says. You know, in the book of Acts, we see uh, well, people don't track this in the book of Acts. It's beautiful. It's this whole idea of like exactly how did the Gentiles fit in, and then mm -hmm. finding that they're full partakers that they they fully partake and we're just brothers and sisters that we're all one in Christ. Ephesians, where it talks about the middle wall of separation being the separation between Jew Gentile and how that has been Amen. taken down and that we're all. We're all unified. We're all one. And then we're all co-heirs. We all inherit together mm -hmm. equally. Male, female, Jew, Gentile, uh, slave, barbarian, all this stuff. We inherit the, the glorious kingdom in Christ. Um, this is... Exactly. Yeah, it's beautiful. It's this, it's this glorious, glorious message, but it's, it, it's the opposite of what we're hearing here or with anybody who leans towards some kind of ethnic supremacy type model of how they view their religious commitments. Yeah. Yeah, some of them say Ephesians 2 is about the rejoining of the North and the South Kingdom. It has nothing to do with the Gentiles, no, some yeah. of them say. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I get why they would have to say that, because the, the right. text refutes right. their theology. It's just right. that, exactly. it's just yeah. that they, can't, they can't say that and be right. <laughs> it's, just, no, no, exactly. Just read Ephesians like, 2, guys. You don't need help on this. <laughs> Yeah. A lot of them say that uh, when James uh, quoted the Old Testament in Acts chapter 15 during that council, a lot of them say he went off, that he simply made a mistake. Because if you read James's speech yeah. and the way he utilizes the Old Testament quotation, it's clearly in favor of Gentile inclusion into this larger body of Christ. And um, it's it's right. an interesting thing. And one way to really determine if you're – let's say you got a Hebrews light friend. And let's say, oh, I'm not down with that hate. That vocab guy tries to make us all sound like that. That would be like if I said, are all Christians part of the KKK? It's really unfair. I'm not like that. Praise God. I hope so. Now, I hope he's got a right view of the gospel. I hope she's got a right view of the gospel. Here's the thing to ask. Can I ask you something about your theology? Do you think it's more important to be in Israel or that it's more important to be in Christ? 
Which one is more important, uh, to be a descendant uh, uh, ethnically of Abraham or a descendant uh, of faith of Abraham, Galatians 3? If they pause and meander or say both are equal, you're dealing with someone who's unbalanced. You're dealing with someone who – so assuming right. they're right about their presupposition for a second, Mike, is what you're doing there. And you're right. trying to find out – I've and almost all of them meander and end up – and some will just say it's more important to be in Israel because you don't have the opportunity to be in Christ unless you're in Israel first. So it just shows immediately Christ is denigrated to just basically a guy who kept the law, like we're going to keep the law too. Mm-hmm. And that's it. Yeah. You know? Oh, man. It, it- yeah, and I, I now on the note of the law, I just want to mention to to my viewers, I've got a series on the Hebrew roots movement, very different movement, mm-hmm. but they do keep the law, and they think that we're all supposed to keep the law today. And I deal with a lot of their talking points and theology and the rhetoric as well. So I, I I'll put a link down below to that later on for people who are interested, because a lot of this same stuff will parallel mm-hmm. uh, if you get into the discussion of how the law applies today. But um, right. Vocab, maybe you – and you could redirect this if you have something you think we need to discuss. But but I was thinking at this point maybe you could talk about like specific tactics on how to reach somebody who's part of this movement. Like what what would you say we should say to them? How should we approach them? How I, how might we break through? And perhaps some of them are watching this right now and they'll listen and consider the things that you're saying. I hope so. Uh, a key is um, the supremacy of Christ versus the supremacy of any ethnic group. And – if you just keep on focusing on Christ and trying to point them to Christ, I think it's a healthy uh, medicine to what they're hearing by a lot of their teachers every day. And uh, let me let me tell you guys, listen, if they if you're talking about Hebrews light and it starts getting into these like political, racial, ethnic, and the next thing you know, you're arguing about um, uh, whether you think the latest cop killing was justified or not. I'm not yeah. saying there's no place for that, but I'm saying watch out for that territory because you're no longer really focused on the gospel. And, you know, are, are you an expert in all those areas? I don't claim to be an expert in all those areas. Right. So I'll say, hey, I don't I don't know. Let me just approach that with a humble attitude. But I, I, this this I do know is important. And it's very difficult a lot of times to redirect in a gentle way the conversation back to Jesus because a lot of times there's not a, there's not a very Jesus-centered uh, view here. So that's one key thing. Watch out for the landmines and pitfalls, and you got to have some thick skin. But the biblical way to say it, Mike, is the fruit of the Spirit. Not that we all display it all the time, but where there's patience and peace and long-suffering and gentleness and kindness and self-control right there in the the core of who you are because the Spirit's working, and rely upon that. And when do you get to see if you're patient? You see, it's in the midst of tr- tr- turmoil, right? Oh, yeah. well, how do you know if someone's gentle? You see, it's in the midst of those situations. My point is, a lot of Hebrews lights, God bless their soul, and I'm not saying this in a mocking way. They're casually racist without even recognizing it. So they might say some offhanded things, and you just got to put that – Aside, I, I just right. to me, you can't focus on every slight that they give and everything that they are going to say, oh, yeah. right? Because they're going to do that. They're going to say, well, listen, the Bible is not even meant for you anyway, so it's not your book. So you don't have any business telling me about it. Just kind of ignore, go over, and just focus back on the Scripture itself because that's where the power is, Hebrews 4.12, 2 Timothy 3.16. And you gotta, you got you, you to gotta watch out. There's a thousand pitfalls they'll get you on. Just because of the way Hebrew Israelites sort of process things. And you just got to say, let me focus on the gospel. Let me focus on God. Let me go over here. And uh, here's the good thing about talking to Hebrew Israelites, though, Mike, is a Christian gets a chance to see better the relationship of the Old and New Testament and how Christ is the yes and amen. And I, all of us can do better on that. And when we read the New Testament, it's just filled with all these connections to the old, and none of us know them all, and they're all beautiful. So instead of just getting frustrated when you talk to Hebrews, like, because let's say it's at your job, it's a long term relationship, it's not out on the corner with a, a camera or whatever, right? You're, you're talking to them day by day. It can feel very frustrating and very taxing and very difficult. Just say, this is God's way for me to learn the Old Testament connections to the new better and how Christ fulfills them. And guess what? I'm a Christian. I love the Bible and I love Jesus. So I'm excited about that. So even if he insults me, I'm okay with that because I want to see how Jesus fulfills the law better. And God can use the Hebrews light in your life to better do that. So guess what? It's also about your sanctification. I really do believe these things because the church does need to rise to the, rise to the occasion because sometimes the Hebrews lights have some good points. There's a lot of bad churches out there, Mike, and there's been a lot of racism 
where the church has either been silent on it or uh, been down with it. Now, I don't mean the black church, obviously. I mean the mainstream church. This has happened. And so there's there, they, there's some valid points sometimes they'll make. That doesn't mean the solution is right, though, right? right. And so I think it's good for us to learn that and, and go and, um, and yeah. uh, just take the challenge in love, everyone. Just take mm-hmm. the challenge in love and see what happens. Yeah. So, okay, um, <clears throat> on this, what are some, like, specific angles you you like topics you want to bring up in discussion with someone that's part of the hebrew israelites like you're like thinking here's an issue i want to bring up here's an issue i want to bring up things that you like to talk about as opposed to the things that you want to let just pass pass by and not comment on right um how how important is it or has it ever been to be a blood israelite in the first place that's that's one thing, and so what you, there's there's a lot of ways to approach that, but I, to me that's important mm-hmm. because I I think it can kind of take away um, the supremacy they put upon this newly discovered revelation, right. and in some ways you can do that is you can say well let's look at examples of 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 non Israelites. Um, that God saved or used, you know. Uh, think about this, ladies and gentlemen. Everyone prior to Abraham, they're, they're not Israelites. Mm-hmm. You know, so if, if Job is prior, but obviously Adam, Noah, you know, this is before that. Uh, Methuselah, Enoch, you know, that's that's important to understand. Yeah. Uh, and then, of course, you have Abraham, so he is called out, he is chosen, and you go on. But then within the story of the, his descendants, you have Folks who are clearly portrayed in a favorable light, to say the least. There's a whole book called Ruth. Ruth is a Moabitess. Yeah. She is a Moabitess, right? And and look what she says. Your God will be my God and your people will be my people. Yeah. And, and there she the is. Genealogy of Christ, yeah. Yeah, so even Jesus himself is not a pure Israelite. Mm-hmm. You see, you, you, excellent, exactly. The Assyrians. Jonah was sent to Nineveh. Here you have uh, this this thing that's supposed to be fulfilled, where Israel is supposed to be a light into the nations, and uh, Jonah is called not even to his own people, to to an enemy group of people, to go and say repent, and God gives them grace and mercy there, and He says, "Look, Jonah, you need to care about them the way I care about them." That that doesn't seem like uh, something a. a ethnocentric God in the way that they view it doesn't seem like something he would do, right? Uh, Rahab and her family that were saved during, remember when they went in? The Canaanite woman there in Matthew 15. The proselytes at Acts chapter 2. It literally says proselytes. The Philippian jailer, there's no indication he was a, a Jew. Lydia in Acts chapter 16. Cornelius, Acts chapter 10 of the Italian band, right? Uh, he might have even been a tenor, bad joke. But you look and you see Cornelius, a Gentile. You have the Ethiopian in Acts chapter 9 with Philip, right? You have the Roman centuria that Jesus dealt with. You have the the um, the Samaritan in Acts chapter 8. You have uh, the Greeks that are mentioned in Acts chapter 11. And most of the audience that the New Testament letters are written to is a mixed audience. And you can even tell by some of the ways things are worded and the things are spoken. And then you go to the end of the book in Revelation chapter 7. And what is Revelation chapter 7, verse 9, for example, I believe it is? What does it say about that in vision of God's people? everybody. It says, there was a vast multitude from every nation, tribe, people, and language, which no one could number, standing before the throne and before the Lamb. They were clothed in white robes with palm branches in their hands. It's a multi-ethnic throng worshiping Jesus Christ, right? And so, I think it's important for people to see the global vision because they'll say, well, look, these promises were given to God's descendants. Yes, the promise is fulfilled in who? You got to go to Galatians to see it's through Jesus. But even the Abrahamic covenant, here's the last thing I'll say, even the Abraham would come out. I think it's really important for people to see it was to do what? To bless the families of the earth or to bless all nations or all peoples, depending on what translation you use. When God first comes to Abraham, it's what he it's part of what he says why he's gonna do through him. Yep. So it's very important for people to see God always has this grand vision and it's fulfilled in Christ, and it's going to be fulfilled in that final picture of the kingdom with this all tribes, all nations, all people, all language. And that's what the New Testament church is supposed to be doing in the meantime, connected directly to Matthew 28, go to all nations. Because the Hebrewites, a lot of them have to make that go to the Israelites in all nations. But that's not what it says, right? Mm-hmm. All ethnos. And so I just think that grand vision of what God's intention to do through Israel is important to see. And that's why you see all these people included in. And we haven't even covered them all. Caleb, 
of Joshua and Caleb, mm -hmm. he's not an Israelite. Now, he eventually gets engrafted into Judah, but he's what's called a Kenizzite. Remember Uriah? He's a Hittite fighting yep. in David's army, more yep. righteous than David himself. Now, this is not a good example. Doeg the Edomite, one of Saul's guys, because he was kind of a bad guy, but it shows how there, it shows how uh, it, they didn't have the understanding of the Hebrew Israelites. And, 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 and Jesus, he gets in trouble because he says things like, hey, <laughs> prophets had to go outside and heal lepers. They had oh, to yeah. go outside Israel. And they were, yeah, they didn't like yeah. that because they knew yeah. what he was saying, right? Yeah. He's like, here's a bunch of Gentiles. And then the <laughs> next thing he does is he goes out and heals the Gentile, uh, to cast the demon out of this Gentile woman. Exactly. Kid. Exactly. So, um, and, and we haven't even covered the specific teaching passages where the issues of Gentiles are brought up like didactically, where it's like, let's walk you through how Gentiles relate right. to it. But you're just giving the examples. And I think that that's powerful. So you would actually, it sounds like you wouldn't go down the road of, let me prove to you that you don't have this Hebrew ancestry that you think you have. Like you would instead say, let me show you that this isn't the thing. This isn't what, what we should focus on. Well, so here's the thing, Mike. Yes, I'm saying that in theory, but the challenge becomes in practice, they are so obsessed with this newly discovered ethnic identity they think they possess that it almost becomes impossible not to it sometimes. And so I've tried to learn little things to try to bat it away and get back to the topic at hand, but it becomes very difficult. Yeah. And so sometimes, let's say it's in a more combative setting. Because I deal with some of their their apologists. So I'm not talking about your friend at work or your cousin who turns. I'm talking about a guy who's leading other people into captivity, basically mm -hmm. through bad doctrine, into bondage, into slavery, right? I, I'll deal a little more differently with some of those guys. I'll try to be friendly. But if they start pushing stuff, let's say we're trying to set up – I was recently trying to set up a debate with a guy. And he said, well, Vocab, I want to debate you on does being an, 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 does being an Israelite matter? Right. That's what he wanted to debate me on. I said, OK, I'll debate you on that after we do a first debate where you prove that you are an Israelite. Well, it doesn't matter from an Israelite because, you know, whether I am or not, the Bible has I know that that'll be the first thing. So I have taken a stance when I deal with their apologist guys a little bit more where before they're going to try to use this stuff or I try to say, hey, look, Gentiles, too. Yeah. I want them to – but here's the thing. No given person can go back all the way to Jacob and prove their ethnicity right. on their dad's side. Even if you were pure all the way, let's just hypothetically say, which is, by the way, pretty much impossible. You know, That's like 86 or something generations removed from Jacob we're now. Yeah. Nobody can do that, right? And so they'll say, well, I'm going to prove in general black Americans or something like that. But see, that doesn't say anything about you. And you're basing your whole future and everything else, the fact that you're an Israelite and other people aren't, yeah. and yeah. yet you have no real way to prove that you are an Israelite. And they get – the problem is they can become very upset because let me tell you what's happening there. And you got to try to do it in a gentle but also firm way, Mike. It's like getting and knocking down idols. This yeah. is their new idol they worship at the feet of regardless of what they say, and you're, you're, you're endangering that. And they can become very hostile at that point. I'm not saying everybody, yeah. but it, it, you'll see the fangs come out with some of these, especially their apologist guys. Yeah, it makes sense because that. they see there as being like uh, ethnic superiority is part of God's created order and his yeah. cho his chosen way for humans to interact. And they're right. part of the superior ethnicity. And you come mm -hmm. and you say, no, you're not, which means they're what? They're down here now, right? Now they're part of the inferior ethnicity. Which is, of course, a category we reject, and biblically right. we should reject, but at least I think in their framework, when you say you're not really an Israelite, it seems like if they if they believe that, then they suddenly become inferior. Um, yeah. And I, I mm -hmm. just imagine this would create a – it's weird because those who, are, who tend to be puffed up or have, have also like equally deep insecurities, okay, when you feel like you're the superiors and all this, it's – it's jarring to have somebody else be as intelligent as you or as, as, as feel like they're entitled to as much as you are. So, you know, in, in, a, in another approach, you could say, yeah, let's first tackle whether this whole superior thing even matters, which is why you say, hey, how much does it matter to be an Israelite in the first place in Christ? And, uh, and then you, you sort of you reframe it and then all of a sudden they're not committed. They don't need to be Israelites to have all this value and have this future and have this hope and have this, these promises from God. And so then they're more open, hopefully, to saying, yeah, okay, this isn't historically accurate, but it doesn't matter that much either. Yeah, Galatians, the book of Galatians is 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 so important. Every single chapter in there, you know, Paul, 
uh, defines the heavenly city as uh, something different than just this. He he redefines Zion as the heavenly city versus just a spot in the map in Israel. I, I, when you look at the way he talks about it, it, it he, he does so much there where all the things that they would hold on to are shown to to have a greater, deeper significance uh, about the seed of Abraham, what that means, about what it means to be in Christ, and about what it means to be a true descendant of Abraham. Because the Bible does say we as Christians are descendants of Abraham. Remember, that's the old song, Mike. Father Abraham, admit, that's the song. Have you ever wondered about that? That song is more right than a lot of Hebrews like theology because it's saying <laughs> we're, we're, pat, we're, we're following the pattern of his faith. We have the and same that's faith. The truth. We're not genetically, yeah, and that's, but we do have the faith. Yes, that's the true son or daughter of Abraham. And the reason we know is because in Galatians it says, those who are of Christ are of Abraham's seed. That's that's the real thing. Mm -hmm. It's not um, some ethnic designation that you can't even demonstrate e anyway. And Titus 3, 9 says, don't get caught up in endless genealogies. And yet these guys carry around a genealogy chart with them. Yeah. You know, and so and so uh, we look oh. that there's just really a, a off balance theology here. All right. Hey, hey, tell us, explain us to us the Hebrew. OK, so I, I forgot I wanted to talk about this, but they oh, the, yeah, yeah, yeah. within the black Hebrew Israelites is some of the most strange and hilarious impressions of Hebrew that I've heard. Could you explain what's going on there? Like they have their own version of Hebrew, right? Only the one Westers do. Oh, OK. Only the one Westers do. So it's called Lashawan Quidosh. And Lashawan Quidosh is a essentially an invented dialect of Hebrew where they basically claim that all the modern vowels, uh, excuse me, are incorrect. And so the vowels, um, which were added later as far as the, the, the markings were added later to – because back then they would be supplied by the speaker because the speaker knew just by looking at the consonants in the passage. They, they still they, do that in they, modern they, Hebrew, yeah. Yeah, so now you have the little vowel markers. They basically say those are all wrong, right? Excuse me, I got my Italian soda, and um, it's it's a uh, <clears throat> – okay. So, so, so what they do is they basically turn them all into the ah sound with a few exceptions. So even in the term, uh, which means holy or pure tongue, Lashawan Kadash, that's what it means. Uh, you see like you would normally have Kadesh or Kadosh, it's Kadash. And so lion becomes Arya, and uh, you have their names they choose is Tazadakia. You see all, uh, that's what all the uh, – rise Israel which is a chant they chant. It's Kwam Yasharala. And they basically just make everything the ah sound. And so Jesus' name is Yahawashai. And uh, the as God's to, name. As opposed uh, to a, well, what most Yesh people would think. Cor yeah, Yeshua. Correct. Yeshua, yeah. So it's Yahawashai? Yahawashai, yeah. yeah. So you, you see that there's some kind of could be that I sound. I'm speaking English transliteration there. Mm -hmm. And so they would say that the name of God is Yahawah. But this only is the one Westers. Um, if you went and talked to um, another group of Hebrews lights, uh, let's say um, – uh, well, I'll just – I'll go with Israel of God again. They would say we don't hold the Lashwan Kadash. We don't think that that's accurate or right. So they, they basically want to engage in a more uh, standard understanding of Hebrew. And so when you hear them uh, – pronounce it it's just a way that they um, sort of have created a way where you can't understand what they're saying and they're also discounting uh what they call yiddish so they a lot of them call modern hebrew yiddish but yiddish actually is a different thing than modern hebrew right mm -hmm. and but they'll just dust it off as oh that's that so if you say yahweh they'll be like that's not the real name it's yahawa and so a lot of them even begin their videos will say um They'll say, you know, Hashem. They they do like a they'll do like a little chant in Lashwan Kodesh sometimes. And when someone kisses their boot, they'll say Kwam Yasharala. But uh, it's not really um, it's not historically based. I'll just put it that way. And um, it doesn't really do much except make them sound odd. They they don't really get much out of it. Yeah, but it also I think circles the wagons more. Because we have like, you know, you learn this way of mm -hmm. saying these things, you learn these sort of key phrases, and it's kind of like a password that shows that you're really part of the in-group, you're one of the trusted ones, and then everybody else is, it, it, it increases the conspiratorial attitude towards actual people who speak Hebrew, or who might come in and bring a scholarly view on something. It's like, no, 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 we've got our own version of everything now. Yeah. 
Yeah, yeah. Uh, there's a little article. There's a couple articles you can find. An example would be, you know, when you hear it, like for example, like Genesis one one, which would be like Bereshit bara Elohim et Hatashayim vid Haretz. Instead, it would be Barashayat bara Alahayim at Hashayim wat Haretz, or something like that. You know, it, it just sounds different. But yeah, yeah. it kind of creates a little code. But none of them are even fluent in it. What I mean is no one has ever been able to uh, have a discussion of Lashawan Quidosh. And whenever you hear them try to use it in an actual sentence, and and I have a friend, Abu Kamar, who, who is more linguistically advanced than I am. He shows how they're using English syntax when they do their Lashawan Quidosh. And right. so their pronunciation is the stylized pronunciation, but mm -hmm. their syntax is all anglicized. And right. so it, a lot of times it doesn't even make sense what they're saying because there is no one who can say to you, where's the bathroom in Lashawan Quidosh? And it's funny, sometimes they'll put out these lexicons and they'll have like how to say crocodile or television in Lashawan Quidosh. And it's like silly because clearly it's anachronistic like why do you have television in Lashwan <laughs> yeah. but uh but uh it's kind of a way to show you're down with the old school too because some right. of the groups are starting to get away from it hmm. all right well what are final words final words you'd have for the audience for anybody who's listening that might be part of the hebrew israelite movement um what's your what's your advice to them your counsel to them well I would like to see more Christians engage them on the street. I know it's not for everybody, and I know it can be a harrowing experience. But, I mean, I just think we should learn how to do this and and uh, better you talking to them than an unsuspecting person they're going to catch off guard. And I do wish more Christians would say, okay, Lord, help me in this situation. One day I may be persecuted for my faith and go before kings and rulers. I can handle talking to these guys. Yeah. But I know everyone's not going to do that, and I know it can be difficult. Okay, but um, just just um, I would encourage people to, to to try to do it. You know, when you see someone wearing the fringes at Walgreens, you know, ask them, "Are you a Hebrew Israelite?" You know, you might see their fringes. You might you might think, just try to find opportunities and just ask questions about their theology and what they believe, and kind of learn and grow with them. Yeah. And so I just really want people to have an openness and not to minimize and realize, you know, souls are at stake. Yeah. I really hope people can do, and you'll grow in the process. And another thing I would say is, hey, get my book. I got a little book. It's yeah. called Barack Obama versus the Black Hebrew Israelites. It's, it's not about <laughs> Obama. It's just a, a title to make you remember it. But it's a little primer. It won't answer all your questions, but it will help you. And it's on Amazon. Yeah. And you can get it. So Great. They can get that. I'll put a link <laughs> down below to that on Amazon as well as just I really like your counsel of uh, bring it back to Jesus, bring it back to Jesus. The, this to me seems like it seems like reading Jesus in context is like an antidote to a lot of the things that I'm hearing. Um, and then uh, any verse that, that is used, stop slow down, look at it in context, unpack it, and then and then you're slowly disarming all of the talking points as you do that. But um, but yeah, uh, Vocab, I have links to your content down below for people. If you guys want to check out Vocab's content down below, you can. He's street apologist, uh, but he's also, you're part of a, a group of guys. I mean, loosely connected to a whole bunch of guys that are doing mm -hmm. similar types of things like that. And so if you guys are interested, maybe even interested in you want to do more apologetics, like connect with these guys. Like they're very open, they're very friendly, and they've got a lot of experience just doing this stuff. So I want to see more Christians out there. You got your YouTube channel. I want to see more people doing content online. And so if anybody's, you're thinking about it, why not give it a shot? Why not give it a shot? Just uh, just do it for Christ and not for YouTube status because that's going to ruin it. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I agree. Those are wise words. Yeah, come out yeah. come out on the street with us when we do go. Every time I take a, a newer Christian in the sense of they haven't been out there mm -hmm. and they go talk to some Hebrews lights or whatever, uh, if we go out on the street, they always learn a lot and, and we have good fellowship. And uh, I, I've seen a lot of people develop hearts for these guys. Even when they're not exactly kind to us, people d d develop more of a heart by being kind of up close and personal and just kind of hearing and, and looking right there. I, I think it can help if you're if you go in a in a in a right mindset. Now, again, you might see some videos where, um, you know, th this this is a very contextualized thing. So there's sometimes, you know, you're, tr you're trying to figure out what's the right way to approach this context because they put you in very tricky situations. And, you know, you may not always deal with it right, but uh, you, we still got to step out there because ultimately it's the Holy Spirit. And so it's not our perfection and our answers and just be willing and learn as you go. So and I'm where, glad where you gave me the opportunity to talk about it. Where are you I'm located? In Phoenix. 
I'm in Phoenix. Yeah, Phoenix. I'm, I live in right. Phoenix. So yeah. if you guys are in Phoenix area, maybe you could hook up with Vocab. That'd be awesome. And uh, they can come out and meet us when we go to San Diego again, too. That's right. I want to. Next time you guys come to San Diego, I want to come down and, and see. It's not too far from me. So we'll see. Uh, but don't tell anybody. <laughs> yeah. Shh. All right. All right, y'all. Uh, thank you guys so much for joining. And um, thank you, Vocab, for being part of this. Uh, the next time I'm streaming is um, Friday. Friday for the q and I've got some other things I'm working on and producing. In fact, I'll, here's a little thing. I, I always do this, and I shouldn't do this. Vocab, this is a lesson I never listen to. But um, I want to do a video dealing with, like, the theology of, like, white supremacy. Like, how oh. – but I'm looking to find, like, someone who seriously tries to use the Bible to support, not just talking points, right, where they throw out ridiculous statements, but, like, they really a, – a real smart person really tries to use the Bible to support their white supremacy – and I have not been able to find it. And so I even reached out to a few scholars, scholars who've written on the KKK and said, help me find somebody in the movement who, or, or even in the past, who like tried to really get the theology going. And um, I just had a scholar reach back to me today, this morning, and she's like, yeah, um, nobody did. Like they just have like talking points here and there, but no one that, I, that they know of dug deep in. So I'm still looking and it, it's led me to look into the Christian identity movement, which is kind of like mm -hmm. a modern white supremacist thing. So if I can find that, or if somebody knows it, you can go to my website, biblethinker.org and send me a link. I do not want a preacher who's white supremacist. I want someone who like seriously looks at the Bible and they're smart and they actually, they kind of make it look like the Bible supports their racism. Like I'm looking for that so I can refute it. I'd like to do that video. I just haven't found it. It's always the worst, most janky talking points of things out of context. So you got yeah. thoughts on that vocab? Well, I don't know if these guys would suit your bill, but there are the Anglo Israelites. The Anglo Israelites. <laughs> is it like the mirror image of the uh, Hebrew Israelites? Yeah, if you notice, see the tribes. Asher yeah. is Ireland. Dan is the Danes and the Celts. You know. Oh wow! Um, so I'm, I'm Asher. Oh, that's so cool. <laughs> yeah. So. <laughs> oh, yeah, I don't. Man. I don't see Italy on here. But so you've got. Um, the Anglo Israelites, who were actually pretty big about uh, almost a century before the Hebrew Israelites, but they've really died out in popularity. But yeah. there are still some Anglo Israelites around, and um, they use the Bible and history to try to demonstrate they're the real Israelites. And a lot of them uh, have some sort of latent white supremacist ideas as well. Yeah. And the Christian identity movement has taken some of their theology and co-opted into their movement in the modern era. Yeah, I think I think I'm going to pursue the Christian identity thing because I I don't know how many. Anglo-Israelites are actually around, but uh, well, this guy has a YouTube channel, Yar Davidi. He's got oh, yeah. to write books. Um, yeah, I don't know. Anyways, yeah, yeah it'll be interesting I'll, to see what you come up with, Mike. Yeah, yeah, man. I, I, I just want, honestly, legitimately, I want people who really do think that their racism is supported in Scripture to see a good substantive response that takes it on the face, deals with it, walks through it, and then refutes it. So we'll see how it goes. But uh, that's about it. That might be months out. I don't have any idea. I just started the, the very beginning stages of looking for content for that. Oh, the Kenites. The Kenists. The Kenists. Have you heard about them? So yeah. it's there's a, there's a group um, of, of folks, and you can sometimes run into an online. They're called Kenists. I think it's K-E-N-I-S-T. But, I'm, but uh, I don't know of any prominent ones. I'll tell you, but you, uh, in certain message boards, they, they pop up a lot. But, but – um, it's weird, Mike. I think a lot of them are in a far extreme of the theonomist reformed world, these Kenites. Mm -hmm. And I don't know a lot about them, but I know they're a prominent or they're, they're a real thing within certain sectors of like far kind of reformed the, theonomist type circles this is my understanding. If I'm saying something wrong, someone correct me. I'm still learning about the Kenites, but okay. they you do run into them. From what I've heard, so maybe look up. Uh, it, am I saying can I? It's kinists. I'm, I'm, I think I'm saying it wrong. It's kinists, but uh -huh. the, but it's a real thing. Maybe maybe one of them. Yeah, I don't know. Anyways. Google just thinks I meant to type dentists. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, you know what? Let me send you some stuff on that. I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah. Send it to me. Man. Check it out. All right. Um, thanks, vocab. Thanks again. Thank everybody for being joining live. I'm glad you guys were able to do this. Uh, this was delayed because I have my internet issues, but we got it back on track, and it's been a long time coming. So. Thanks, Vocab. You guys can check him out down below. If you got nothing else to do, go check out Vocab Malone's content. See what you think. And uh, we don't agree on everything. I'm not endorsing everything he says. He doesn't endorse everything I say. But we're brothers in Christ, and we agree on the essentials. So we got that. <laughs>